Welcome to Steve Reads Bible Stories. Reverend Steve Janes reads Bible stories while pointing out keys and principles on how to read the Bible. You know, when I think about what we're going to get in today, we're going to get into Jesus Christ at the Garden of Gethsemane. And when I think of that, I always think about, well, in another garden, in the Garden of Eden, Adam said or did not God's will, but what Eve suggested. But Jesus Christ, in a different garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed three times saying, God, if there's any other way, I'd like to do it. But if not, thy will be done. See, Jesus Christ w- wanted to do the will of God, no matter, well, in his place, it, a very unpleasant thing to go through. We'll say That's kind of the easiest way to say it, really. But he said, but not my will, but thine be done. That's what we're getting into. And I think it's, I think it's vitally important or it can help a believer to go through these records from the Last Supper through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to just see, you know, exactly what he accomplished and what he went through. And one of the things that really helps me with that is some music from uh, the Victors. And I'd like to play for you a couple songs before we get started, okay? Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Jesus, Savior, Master, like the fragrance of Bethlehem of Judea. He worked as a carpenter until he was about 30 years of age, when for a short period of time he became an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book, never owned a home, never did any of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. During his short ministry, the religious leaders turned the tide of popular opinion against him and he was turned over to his enemies. His friends deserted him. One of them even denied him. He was nailed on a tree, but God, his father, raised him from the dead. 19 wide centuries have come and gone, and still he is the centerpiece of the human race, the leader of all progress. And I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that were ever built, All the kings and parliaments that ever ruled put together have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as much as that one solitary life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Savior, Master, like the fragrance of 
the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus is getting to the Garden of Gethsemane, after he's taught them all those things on the Mount of Olives on his way to Gethsemane, we continue in Matthew 26, 31. And then Jesus said unto them, all ye shall be offended or made to stumble because of me this night for it is written I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad but after I am risen again I will go before you unto Galilee Peter answered and said unto him though all men shall be offended or made to stumble because of thee yet will I never be offended or made to stumble and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This night before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice or three times. This is a subject that has been 
on their minds since the the location of the Last Supper. Jesus has told them, he says, you're all going to be made to stumble this night, but don't worry about it. I'm coming back. But as they were walking through that path, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus Christ taught them many wonderful things. But this still must have been on their mind because here's Peter saying, I won't be offended. And Jesus said, yeah, you will. The cock's going to crow and thou shalt deny me three times before that happens. And then look at Mark 14.30. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even this night, before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he, Peter, spake more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. And likewise also said they all. Peter got them all to agree with him instead of agreeing with Jesus Christ. But here it says the cock crows twice or two times or the second time. And we will see as we go through these records, Peter denied Jesus Christ six times. Three times, then the cock crows once. Three more times, and then the cock crows again the second time. And I'll point these out to you as we go through them, as we're doing the scripture build-up. But in John 18, 1, And when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples beyond the brook Kidron. There was a garden unto the which he entered and his disciples. And in Matthew 26, 36, And when Jesus was come with them unto the place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here, while I go, go and pray yonder. And in Mark 14, 32, And there came to a place which is called Gethsemane, and he said unto his disciples, Sit ye here, while I shall pray. And in Luke 22, 40, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And these are the records that show Jesus Christ going into the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. And he tells them, Hey, sit here and pray while I go yonder and pray. Okay? And in Matthew 26, 36, Then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane. And he said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which are James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples, and he findeth them asleep. And he said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch or be vigilant with me? one hour and you can see Jesus Christ as a human being being a little bit agitated he asked them to, to pray with him to be vigilant to watch with him and he comes back and, and he finds them asleep and he says what you couldn't keep awake for one hour and you got to remember in the lands and times of the Bible the hour was the shortest measure of time they didn't have you know, watches with second hand. They used the sundial. And every day had 12 hours in it, no matter how long it was. Had 12 hours in a day, in the daylight time. So in the winter, the hours were pretty quick. In the summer, there were longer hours. So, and I'll bet you, you know, when they said things like, hey, I'll meet you at, at noon, People were pretty close to being there at noon. Why? Well, they could tell the time by looking up at the sky. They go, well, it's about noon. Let's go meet whoever you were going to meet at noon. 
but here Jesus is saying to Peter, "What well, you couldn't watch me for one hour? We today we might have say, "What well, you couldn't stay awake for a minute?" Because he just went and prayed and came back, and there he was asleep. In verse forty-one, he says, "Watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak." And he went away again the second time, and he prayed, saying. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. That's pretty neat. When it talks about this cup, that means this mission, this thing that you've given me to do. If, it, if there's no other way, if it, I have to do it, I'll do it. He says, thy will be done. But if there is any other way, I'd like that other way. <laughs> And you can understand why he would say that. We would be saying the same thing, too. In verse 43, And he came and he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and he went away again, and he prayed the third time, saying the same words. And in Luke 22, as we're doing the scripture build-up, looking at every gospel that deals with this same subject, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, it doesn't say that his sweat was great, you know, blood. It was as, or represents. In other words, showing how much anxiety in intense feeling and emotion in those prayers I'm sure at times we've been in situations where we prayed very intensely with a lot of emotion but I don't think we any of us have ever prayed knowing that what we had to do next was to die in verse 45 and when he arose up from the prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Arise and pray, lest ye, lest ye enter into temptation. And in Matthew 26, 45, Then he cometh to his disciples, and he said unto them, and this is when he comes to them after the third time, he says, Sleep on now, and take your rest, Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. When he comes back after the third time, his uh, way of dealing with his disciples has changed. He's not as agitated as he was before. Matter of fact, you can see that he's very tender with them. He says, sleep on now, take your rest. You can see him sort of maybe taking the, their robe and covering them up a little bit maybe caressing their cheek take your rest don't worry about it I'll take care of it see something happened to Jesus Christ between the first two times that he went to pray and the third time and I think it has to deal with that angel coming from heaven and strengthening him and the one way that you get in strengthened is by someone encouraging you. If you have to deal with some intense situation, it's always good if someone comes to you and encourages you, and they do that with words. They say, you can do the job. I love you. Don't worry about it. God loves you. God's your Father. God will take care of you. Just give it to God. Let go and give to God. These are things that people could say to us, and we say to each other to encourage encourage us at times maybe I think of this like a coach might take a player you know in a sporting event and bring him aside and say don't worry you're all right you can do the job and maybe give him some final instructions what to do or or person in business same idea you know they got a, a big deal to do they can bring them aside someone and encourage them here the angel encourages them and in Hebrews, I got written in your notes, 12.2. Uh, and this is what Jesus Christ, it says about Jesus Christ. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith or believing, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. This must have been something that Jesus Christ was able to grab with his mind. It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know, in in the state of Maine, where I live in the state of Maine, they have paper mills, and sometimes these paper mills are uh, closed down. They have shutdowns for a little while while they fix an opportunity or a problem they have. And when they do that, they hire crews to come in and take care of this problem very quickly. And these crews will work around the clock to get that paper mill running again because it means money to them. And they will pay big money to get that paper mill working again. And these crews that go to work on those jobs will work many hours every day until it's done. Sometimes these shutdowns are for a month, six weeks or something. And the members, the people that do that, will, will, will put in all that time and all that work to get the job done with the hope or the belief or the knowing that, hey, when the job's done, I'm going to get a big paycheck. So they will go through that in that time of work, that shutdown for that month to six weeks, working night and day, getting very little sleep, doing their job, knowing that at the end they get the big paycheck. And so Jesus Christ knew that he, after he went through this ordeal, which was terrible, there would be the payoff who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He knew that he would be at the right hand of God. That was his hope. That was his thing that he got to look forward to. When the angels strengthened him, maybe this was one of the things that they told him. But you know what? All of us here, we have a hope too. We endure this life, and we know that when Jesus Christ returns, we're going to be with him, and we got eternal life, and that we're going to, it says in God's word, that we so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's our hope. We can put up with a lot of stuff, too, if someone encourages us with the hope of what we have for us. And like the angels strengthened Jesus Christ, and he, and he didn't like what was going to happen to him, but for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's go to Matthew 26, 46. It says, Arise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, lo Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priest and the elders of the people. And look at John 18, 2. It says, And Judas also, which betrayed him and knew the place, he was well aware that he would be in that garden. For Jesus oftentimes exhorted hither with his disciples. I'd like to just share, and, and, we, and I've been talking a little bit about Jesus Christ the great master teacher and it says here that Jesus Christ was was oftentimes went to their garden with his with his disciples Jesus Christ taught in wherever he was and he used public places like this beautiful garden of Gethsemane which was a beautiful garden and, he, and after meals he must have walked up there many times it says oftentimes whenever he was in Jerusalem he probably went to this garden at night and sat there and taught God's word to his disciples. So this was something that he did oftentimes in his teaching method, just hanging out with his disciples. In verse 3 says, And Judas then, having received a band, and that word is a word for a cohort, which is a military term for a group of soldiers, of men, and officers, from the chief priests and the uh, Pharisees, which came hither with, with lanterns, torches, and weapons. They came to Jesus Christ. Now, 
the the chief priest and the Pharisees in Jerusalem in the temple they had uh, officers or they had Levitical temple guards which did the policing of the temple which did that type of work right and then in Jerusalem also which was occupied by the Roman Empire at that time they had their soldiers there and at this time of year with the uh, Passover feast being just a couple of days away they would be in the, the Jerusalem area police in the area the extra police so when they came to Jesus Christ they came with both the temple guards and the Roman soldiers a cohort which is about a hundred soldiers so there's a hundred soldiers coming with their weapons their lanterns and torches right plus the Levitical priest officers, temple guards that came. So there was a good multitude that came to, after Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 18 verse 4, Jesus therefore, therefore knowing all things that should come unto him, met, went forth and said to them, Whom seek ye? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, I am he and Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell on the ground. Can you imagine this? Here's Jesus Christ, one solitary man, standing there, and they're coming with a cohort of a hundred soldiers, Roman soldiers, who are well-trained, at day day and time of the weaponry and military service at that time they were very good at their swords with work and the temple guard and they go after this one man Jesus Christ Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus says who are you looking for and he says here I am and they fall backwards uh, it just shows you how loving how bold and how confident he was at that time they fell backwards and in John chapter 18 7 then asked he them again whom seek ye and they said Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus answered hey I told you that I am he if therefore ye seek me let these go their way that him that the saying might be filled be fulfilled which he spake of them of them which thou gavest me have I lost none see Jesus Christ immediately says I am he and he starts to negotiate for the safety of his disciples to make sure that they don't lose any of them I mean because they could have very easily just take them all in they had enough men to do it they had enough men to do whatever they wanted to do and in Matthew 26:48. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And Luke 22:47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And in Matthew 26, 49, And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Luke 22, 49, When they which were about him saw that he what would follow them, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smoke the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear wow I want to stop right there just for a second and, and for a moment and say hey you know what Jesus Christ already gave himself up before Jesus said anything betrayed him with a kiss Ju Jesus was ahead of Judas all the way they didn't even need Judas to betray him except Judas said hey, he goes to this garden every night and we could probably find him there but look what happens here it's in uh, Luke 22:49. One of them takes a sword and he smokes the servant of the high priest and cuts off his ear. 
Look at John 18, 10. Then Simon Peter, having, drew, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant, one of the Levitical temple guards, and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Marcus. Isn't this something? When you do the scripture buildup, if you just read Luke, you wouldn't know that it was Peter, and you wouldn't know the name of the servant of the high priest. By doing scripture buildup, you get a little bit more information by reading all the records from all the different Gospels as to what happened. And that's why what we're doing in this class is we're going through all the records in chronological order and looking at all the records from all the different Gospels on each event to get a clearer picture of what happened. And what we see here is that the servant, the, the, the one that drew the sod, his name was Simon Peter, and who he the servant of the high priest, his name was Melchus. And look at Matthew 26, 50. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, what for art thou come? Then, they came? then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were, were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and smoked off his ear. And then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And see, we're doing the scripture build up here. We're seeing what happened at that situation, one record or one event at a time. And here Jesus says, this statement here, it says, For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And many people have taken that verse there and they've pulled it out of that context and they said, See, although Jesus Christ said that all they that take a sword shall perish with the sword. And what they try to infer is that anyone who takes up a weapon will die by a weapon. But we know that that's not really true because policemen all carry guns, right? And not all those that are policemen have died by being shot by a gun, right? Not every, one, not every policeman ever, right? And all those that have gone to war that had, had to have used a sword or a weapon of some sort, they all haven't died by a weapon. A lot of people have gone to, uh, up to war in military conflicts, have did their time in service, then have come back home and never even touched the weapon again lived good lives and didn't, and died of old age. Right. So they didn't die by the sword, right? right? So you can't take this one little phrase and take it out and say, he say, he, Jesus Christ said, all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. We have to use build, uh, scripture build-up. And here we use scripture build-up to take into account the situation. We have to consider his statement within the context of the situation. We also have to take into account to whom he was speaking. Who was he speaking to? He was speaking to Peter, to be exact, of whom what he said was true. Was it true that if Peter picked up his sword and went after him that he would die? I think it's true because there was over a hundred soldiers there with weapons. How many weapons did his disciples have? Two. Two, Two little daggers, right? So... Was it true to what Jesus said to that situation? Yes. And to whom what he says was addressed? It was addressed to that specific situation. If Peter took out his sword and sworn to use it, he most definitely would have perished by someone with a sword. So that's what we have to do. You can't just take a phrase out and say, Jesus said this, and so if you take a sword... And you're going to die by it because we know that's not true just by life in general. There's been police officers who have, who have had guns who have never even drawn their guns. Let's go to Matthew 26, 53. And then he's telling Peter, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels, which is 72,000 angels? But how then shall the scriptures be filled? Thus 
that thus it must be. And what he's saying is, this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen. Put your sword away. And Jesus Christ is already negotiating for the safe travel and passage of his disciples. Look at Luke 22:51. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, or just hold it a moment. And he touched his ear and healed him. That was a good thing for Jesus to do. Jesus calmed the situation by healing that servant's ear immediately. You know what? And I bet you, you know, if you go to a doctor today and you have your ear cut off and they, they fix it, they would sew it back on, and you would see the marks where they sewed that ear back on. This ear here was healed completely. No mark, no nothing. And it had to be that way because the servant would have said, yeah, well, it's not as good as new. Jesus Christ he handled the situation completely. And healed. He touched his ear and healed it. Look at Luke 22, 52. Then Jesus said unto the, to the chief priests and the captain of the temple and the elders which were come unto him, be ye come out as against the thieves with swords and staves when I was daily with you in the temple. He stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. See, Jesus Christ really gave himself up. They didn't come get him. He says, hey, I was with you in the temple daily and you didn't bother me, but you know what? This is your hour and this is the power of darkness. Look at Matthew 26, 56. But all this was done that with the results that the scripture of the prophecy might be or were being fulfilled, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. They got out of there. Jesus Christ made it available for them to go, and they went. Mark 14:51. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men, the guards and the soldiers, laid hold on him. And he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So one young man, doesn't say who it was, was following Jesus, you know, a little bit behind. And the soldiers caught him, and they caught him by this cloth that he had around his body. And he left the cloth and took off. And in Mark uh, 14:54 says, And Peter followed him afar off. And then John 18:12. Then the band and the captain, and the band is this, and the captain is this tribune, a top-level Roman commander. That's how I know that it was at least a hundred soldiers there. And the officers, and those are the officers of the Levitical guards. So there's, there's two group of people, the Roman soldiers and their commander and the Levitical temple gods of the Jews took Jesus and they bound him and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now I gotta tell you a little bit about this Annas and Caiaphas. See Annas was the the high priest the year before and he was the high priest in Judean custom and religion when you was the high priest that was a position that was yours for your lifetime. But you gotta remember they were occupied by the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire didn't like someone being in charge for their lifetime. So they said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to pick somebody else to be the high priest. And so somehow they got his son-in-law to be the high priest. To many people who, who are of Judean belief and faith probably thought that Annas was still the high priest even though the Roman Empire said, no, we're going to have this Caiaphas be the high priest. So the first one they brought him to was to Annas, right? The father-in-law of Caiaphas 
which was the high priest that year because the Roman Empire said that's the high priest. Somehow he got into that position. Maybe Anna said, well, okay, if I have to give it up, we're going to give it to my son-in-law. And he was the one that uh, gave counsel and said, hey, it's expedient that one man should die for the people. And then uh, John 18, 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus. And so did another disciple that that disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus unto the palace, unto an open courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her, that's a female, her, that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel, the girl, the woman that took care of the gate, right, that kept the door unto Peter, art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. This is for Peter's first denial. I am not. And the servant and the officers stood there, who had made a coal of a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. There was a court, an outside court that had a gate to it. There was this woman that kept the gate of the high priest. And one disciple was known, it was able to get in, and he went back and said, Hey, would you let Peter in? And she let Peter in, but then she goes, Hey, aren't you one of his disciples? And he goes, I am not. And then Peter goes, and he warms himself by the fire. And there's a few of the guards and men of the temple there warming themselves by the fire. This was Peter's first denial, and it was the only one that was done while Jesus was before Annas. It was the only one done that. As we continue in this, at, at that night, at that trial that's going to be coming up real soon here, we'll see that Jesus is taken back to uh, Caiaphas for the first trial, and that's where we'll pick it up next time. I'd like to play the last song here for you in closing. There's only one Lord, one Lord of my life, only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. silver or gold the Lord made my life worth riches untold the Lord of my life is not There's only one Lord, one Lord of my life, only one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave his life for me and now I belong to God's family I'm 
I will to live the rest of my life, living each day. episode is complete, so head over to stevejanes.com. While there, sign up for our newsletter. If you're interested in learning how to read the Bible, there's also an audio class and companion books available on how to read the Bible for understanding and power. The website has audio teachings and biblical studies books all there to help you grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen next week for another reading of God's wonderful, matchless word.